page number 23. There is power in the blood. If you're able to stand, why don't you stand with me and we'll start on that first verse. I want to welcome everyone to the adult Sunday school discipleship class. If you're able to stand, let's all stand on the first verse. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Thank you for your singing. You may be seated. Let's have Brother Kevin and Brother Bill come at this time. We'll go ahead and take up an offering. Some of you may not be aware of, uh, Brother Earl Carpenter went to heaven this past week, and his services are actually tomorrow in Harrison from 11 a.m. to 1 o'clock. And then at 1 o'clock, obviously, our service will start and uh, be in prayer for the family and Sister Carol. Carol's in transition right now. She's going to be actually selling a home, moving into assisted living, which is probably the wisest thing to do right now. But let's just keep the whole family in prayer and pray about the services tomorrow, that God would give me the right message to encourage the family and the friends at those, those who have gathered around. All right, Brother Bill, good to see you today. And Brother Kevin, good to see you. And this is some money that has come in the mail. We'll get that where it needs to go. And let's pray for the offering and God's blessings on the teaching of his word today, throughout the entire day, this morning, the preaching, tonight, the preaching. Let's ask for him to bless it. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness in all things. We thank you that we're able to assemble together on this first day of the week that is set aside for preaching and teaching, worship, and so much the more. We do pray that you'd be honored and glorified with what we do. We do pray as we take this offering up that you would bless both the gift and the giver. And we pray today that you'll bless the message uh, throughout the morning service and the message that's going to be presented throughout the evening service. And then we pray your blessings and anointing upon the teaching hour. Thank you for the opportunity. In Christ's name we pray and ask these things in. Amen. Okay, men, why don't you go ahead and move forward. As I said a moment ago, excuse me one moment, I'm going to get some water. Medicine this morning, a little decongestant, it's got me 
a little bit dry. Uh, some have asked about what's going on, not this week, but the following week. I'm going to be a little bit limited, but don't let that fool you. I got things lined up with some of our men. Um, I'm going to have about 30 treatments, so I'll be uh, traveling north here, not this week, but next week, every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday for radiation. And God's going to take care of that. Uh, my messages will be answered, and we'll do what we got to do there, and I'm sure that everything will be good. There is no cancer. Cancer is gone. This is a preventative, and this is what the doctors feel they need to do with me, just as a preventative. Uh, 30 treatments. It was quite interesting this past week. I got to meet a couple of the ladies. It's going to be, well, I'll be seeing them for the next several weeks every day for maybe 20 minutes or so, half an hour, 10 minutes. They fit you with a head cast. That was quite the, the interesting experience. Uh, mold your head and bolt you down to the table. And uh, pretty interesting. Technology is really something. So we're looking forward to getting that over with, but um, be in prayer about that because one, one of the things that takes place with that is dry mouth. And I have that just because I'm on a decongestant. So bear with me there. Acts chapter number two this morning. Acts chapter number two. We're starting um, this teaching this morning, which I'm not just quite sure how long we're going to be on, but I'm going to stay on it long enough to where I I believe and I'm confident that we understand the subject of repentance. Uh, repentance, when the average Christian is asked today, have they repented and when did they repent? Um, not all Christians, not, not all, but the average Christian is like, what exactly do you mean? What, what do you mean? Because uh, we've gotten so kind of used in our society of saying, uh, do you know for sure Jesus is your Savior? And people would say, yes. And I praise the Lord for that. We say, well, when did you get saved? We may say that. And, you know, and, uh, or another term, just to be safe. Well, when did you repent of your sin? What? Well, when did you repent of your sin? I know today I repented of my sin. I know exactly where I was at. I know exactly what took place. And what does this mean when we talk about repentance? Is it a Bible doctrine that is something that we need to be cautious with. Oh, better believe it. You better believe it. We have something here we need to be cautious with. Acts chapter number two. So in Acts chapter two, we're finding Peter the apostle preaching on the day of Pentecost. Several different nationalities have gathered together for this annual Jewish celebration this festival, if you will, this appointed time. The one thing that they're not, they're not interested in at all that they don't know they're about to encounter is this man by the name of Peter preaching this thing called the gospel involving a man named Jesus Christ. They're not traveling there for that, but they're about to hear this. How does this work in their lives biblically? And this is a subject that we got to really, really pay biblical attention to. So let's take a note here in Acts chapter 2. Peter's preaching. And I'm going to come to the tail end of his message for time's sake. Verse 32. So in his preaching, Peter says, this Jesus hath God raised up, that is resurrected from the dead on the third day, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed, excuse me, he has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. So this is the prophecy, actually, of John the Baptist. If you read chapter 1 and 2, this is the fulfillment of the prophecy of John the Baptist that he spake of some three, three and a half years earlier, coming to pass. Verse 34, For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Set thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, as kind of a conclusion, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now let's stop. Well, they're not expecting nothing like this. What? I mean, this isn't what they came for. They did not come to hear this message. They came to be involved in the celebration, the festival of Pentecost. But Peter's preaching. Now let's look at the response. Verse number 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, 
So obviously they were convicted by the person of the Holy Ghost. Would we all agree with that? Would we all agree with that? They're convicted of the Holy Ghost. They're pricked in their heart. All right. Now, and said unto Peter, who was preaching, and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now watch. Watch what's going on. The mind is twisting here and turning. The mind is like, what? What shall we do? Repentance starts right here. Real, bi- real biblical repentance starts in the mind. Okay, these men know something's wrong with them and something's right with him. They know something's wrong with them and they know something's right with this message. They're being convicted about this. What shall we do? So the mind is turning here and the mind is asking a question. Now, Peter says in verse number 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words that he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. So let's stop. They're hearing a message. This message has convicted them about the person of Jesus Christ. What type of con- conviction is going on here? An agreeance. Biblical repentance is based on agreeing with God. This is why as Christians, we don't, we, we, we understand that when we get saved, we understand our condition. We agree with God that we're lost. We agree with God that there's trouble. We agree with God, we're, we're, we got a problem here. Okay, so this is all going on. There, there's some agreements here. Verse number 41, look, look what happens. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Watch this now. Repentance is not only a change of mind. It is a change of action. Biblical repentance always has a change of action. Now I'm not talking about lordship salvation. We don't believe in that here. We believe that Jesus is Lord of salvation. But we don't believe in lordship salvation in the sense that there should be, um, um, well, we won't even get into that right now because I don't think, I think the lesson will reveal this. So watch. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. See the direction change? See the action change? They was not here for this at all. Repentance changed their thinking. What shall we do? Repentance changed their thinking, I believe. Repentance changed their thinking. I will get baptized. Repentance changed their action. They continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers, and fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed, verse 44, were together and had all things common and sold their possessions. See this change of action? See this action change? And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple. This wasn't previous. This was not a previous thing in their life. They weren't in the temple with one accord. They did not sell their possessions. A change has taken place here. It started with the mind and it went into their action. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now the basic meaning of repentance, the majority of time in the Bible, we associate it with salvation most of the time. Sometimes in the Bible, the word repentance is not associated with salvation. The word is found over 100 times, about 115 times in the Bible, give or take. But the word basically means with salvation, a change of mind, which leads to a change of action. Now the change of mind, according to the Bible, which we'll learn, is sorrow. Sorrow. Godly, by the way, godly sorrow. Not worldly sorrow, that's a counterfeit, which we will cover. That's a counterfeit. 
a godly sorrow. So repentance would be a change of mind which leads to a change of action. So I can just say this in my personal testimony, I'm not telling you that what I did you need to do, that's your business, but I can guarantee the day I was sitting in the pew over here, I experienced godly sorrow. And I wanted to act on that and I left that seat and I made a move up here. And from that day to this day, my life has been different. My life has been different. Everything about my life has been different. <clears throat> now, obviously there was faith in Christ, no doubt, because when I came forward, I was convicted or pricked in heart about my sin. You know what I started to do? I started to see my sin the way God sees it. That's one of the big problems in America today in our Christian churches. Christians are involved in all kinds of sin today because they don't see it for what it is. They have no idea. They don't see the, the, the necessity of repentance or they don't see sin clear. So that day I see my sin and I thought, you know what? I'm a, I'm a dead man. And I'm just talking to you how I felt. I said, I'm a, de- I'm, I'm a goner here. I'm going to split hell wide open. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. And I made my move. Now watch. I didn't make my move there because my mom or dad told me to do that. I didn't make my move there because somebody else told me to do that. Godly repentance birthed my faith. And I do believe we got a lot of salvation testimonies without ever experiencing. You should have a testimony where you are under godly sorrow for your sin. You should have that testimony. And, and, and if not, then what, why do you even need Christ? Why would you even need him? If there's no seeing sin the way God sees sin, and if there's no understanding sin the way that God wants us to understand sin, then why do you even need to trust in Jesus Christ? Because he's the one that forgives sin, that wipes that or at least eliminates that out of our life so that we are acceptable unto God. And why would we want to be acceptable unto God if we don't think prior to that salvation that our sin is separated from him or separated us from him? So, change of mind, which leads to a change of action. Now, sorrow. Let's, let's, let's just look at this. Why was I feeling sorrow that day? i tell you why I was feeling sorrow that day. Because I was living a wicked life. My actions. My conduct. My character. That's what repentance does. Repentance shows you your conduct's wrong, your character's wrong, you're in the wrong direction, you're in the wrong way. Now, the world copies this all the time by saying, oh, please forgive me. But it's not the type of repentance we're talking about. It's a sorrow, but it's a worldly sorrow that leadeth not to repentance. So, that day, at least in my life, I had sorrow, and I had sorrow from an experience. I had sorrow from an experience of pain and grief of the sin that was active in my life. That's what I experienced that day. And I think we'll see this throughout the Word of God, my own conduct. So so watch, I responded in action. What did I respond in action for? Away from that conduct, away from that lifestyle, away from that problem. Away from that grief, away from that sorrow. That's right. That's right. This is biblical repentance. Okay, this is what we call Bible, biblical repentance. Now, we'll, we'll see this once again. It, it can mean to regret or to be sorry uh, for, but most of the time it deals with a change of mind because there's sorrow for personal conduct against God and God only. It's a sorrow of mine because of personal conduct, the pain and grief that comes from that type of conduct, and it's getting away from that conduct. But it's really the work and the aid and the power of the Holy Spirit that works all of this together. Now, the direction or the action, we would say, would be away from that conduct which calls grief, which calls sorrow. Should not a Christian have the testimony of, man, when I lived in the world, boy, I had a lot of problems. You should have that kind of testimony because when you're living in the world, that's the kind of life you have. And so, this is a simple thought. Change of mind, which leads to 
change of direction, repentance. We're going to just kind of keep that in mind. Let me, let me give you some examples of this. I want you to listen. You can take note if you're taking note. But for instance, again, not all the time is this word used in the sense of salvation. But you'll see the definition being used through Scripture. Remember when the children of Israel left Egypt? Remember when they left there and it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them through not the way of the land of the Philistines. Although it was close, why did God do that? Lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and return to Egypt. Lest when they get out there they change their mind about leaving Egypt and change their action and go back. And again, we got to stick to the Bible on this because the, the word is, is a word that's, um, I mean, I'm not a Greek expert. I don't want to get into all that. But I'm just saying we can see definitions of this. So in Exodus 13, 17, it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them th not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war. That word repent means change mind. When they see war and they return to Egypt. So they would change their mind if they seen war. Then that, change, that mindset of, of seeing that, that is the Philistines, when they would see war, would make them fearful and run back to Egypt. Change of action. Two things here. Um, Remember, the, here, give me another thought. The book of Jonah. What about when the Ninevites turn from their sin? Well, I mean, Jonah went and preached. And when they repented, the Bible says in Jonah 3.10 that God saw their works, watch this carefully, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them and did it not. Do we have a change of mind here? God changed his mind. God changed his mind of the evil that he said he would do unto them. There was a change of action from God too. He did it not. He did not overthrow them. Now there are some that say, well, God don't repent. You might want to read that scripture a little bit more clear in the book of Numbers chapter number 23. It's not saying that God doesn't repent. It says God's not a man that he should repent. Meaning this, God doesn't make mistakes that causes him to repent of mistakes. God is perfect. God is perfect. But the fact of the matter is, every man and every woman right now who does not know Christ as their Lord and Savior is under condemnation. As I speak, they're not going to be underneath of it. They're under it right now. The wrath of God abideth on them right now. And when they make their way toward the cross and understand why Christ died for them and then understand their sin against God, they are able to receive salvation. And we know that there is a complete transformation. Their name is written in the book of life. Condemnation is not their sentence of death. They have now grace. And there's a change there in the sense of what their destiny would be, not in the lake of fire, but in heaven. Now, when we find repentance applied in the Bible, we can, definition-wise, definition-wise, although, again, many times it refers to sin and salvation, sometimes it's, it's a general thought of um, just to show you that it's a change of mind that leads to a change of action. A change of mind that leads to a change of action. For instance, listen carefully. Now watch. And, and by the way, I think this is very very important, especially in a local New Testament church as a pastor, um, when it comes to making sure that we're clear in the message. That is the message of salvation, which does involve repentance and faith. They cannot be separated, by the way. Repentance and faith cannot be separated. All right, listen carefully. Job chapter 42, I'm going to start at verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord. So Job is answering the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not, things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. 
I will demand of thee and declare unto me. Watch. Watch this carefully. Listen to this. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye has seen what happened here. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. What's Job saying here? Change of mind. He is seeing himself now the way he really needs to see himself. He's seeing himself clearly. I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. So this is a change of mind. Let's look at that change of mind. Did Aunt Isaiah do the same thing? They're going to sing today a song in the choir, which I think is a great song. Holy, holy, holy. It's not old-fashioned. It's wonderful. But when you find Isaiah in the year the king Isaiah died, yeah, he got a proper view of God, didn't he? What did he say? Woe is me. Woe is me. He is seeing himself the way God sees him. Are you following me? And by the way, only the Holy Ghost can do this. I can't do this, and I cannot get this into a person's mind. Only the Holy Ghost can show a man what God thinks of him in his sight and his condition. I can preach against it, and pre or, well, not against it, but I can preach paralleling it. Let me give you another thought. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 47. If yet if yet they shall bethink themselves in the land whether they were carried captives, and it's a Solomon, and repent and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captives, saying, we have sinned, we have done perversely, we have committed wickedness. What is he saying here about repentance? When they would be carried off into Babylon, if they would start to see their sin the way God sees their sin and realize why they're in captivity, their sin. Their sin. So, this is a change of mind. We're talking change of mind now. Okay? Where they were led captives and repent and make supplication in the land of them that carried them captive, saying, Here's the repent. We have sinned in the mind. We have sinned and have done perversely and have committed wickedness. And, and the reason that somebody can do this is because, again, they're seeing themselves the way God sees them. And they're agreeing with how God sees them, not their self. And that can be a problem, problematic in Christianity. Some Christians are, you know, caught up daily in certain sins, and they may say it's just a little bitty sin. And the problem is with it this, they're not seeing that sin from the angle and the viewpoint of God. They're not seeing it from God's standpoint. And when we don't see sin from God's standpoint, we justify the sin in which we're involved in. But when we see it from God's standpoint, we cannot justify our sin. We're forced to do two things, cover it or forsake it. That's it. And if we cover our sin, we're not going to... And, and the cover sin is act like it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. We'll talk about that in a moment. Jeremiah, listen to chapter number 8, verse 6. Again, we're just dealing with change of mind with the thought of repentance. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Here it is. What have I done? What are you talking about? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rushes in the battle. Again, Jeremiah 8, 6. I hearkened and heard... But they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? And so this man obviously is not seeing his issue the way God reveals his issue. And this was always a problem with the nation of Israel. To, to an extent, to the book of Malachi, there was the back and forth, back and forth there with, um, where have we robbed thee? Well, why don't you just read the Bible? Where and have we left thee? Why don't you just read the Bible? And again, this is a soul work of the Holy Ghost. Jeremiah chapter 31. Listen to verse 18 and 19. Change of mind here. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus. 
thou hast, watch, chastened me. And I was chastened as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned. For thou art the Lord my God. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. And after I was instructed, I smote my thighs. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. Here he is seeing his sin. As God reveals sin. Um, the local New Testament church that was in the book of the Revelations, chapter 2, verse 5. He says, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Remember, it starts right here. Remember where thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. And he says, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Now here, let me just say this as a little brief summary. Repentance means the sinner sees himself and his sin exactly how God sees it. The sinner does this with God. I agree with you. I totally agree with you. This is evil. This is wrong. I totally agree. Amen. It's the mind. It's the change of the mind. Now, what about the action? Now, by the way, when we talk about the mind, uh, that's, that's the way it should lay out. But we know it doesn't lay out always that way. I mean, in the direct sense of God's will being carried out. Listen to Proverbs chapter number 28 and verse number 13, please. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse number 13, we find, I quote, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So when it comes to sin, there is confession or covering. Confession or covering. Now, the word cover means this. Here's what the, the, the word cover means. The word cover means no confession. It means no confession. It means this, no change of mind. I don't need to, I don't need to ask God for forgiveness. <clears throat> so when a person, as Solomon is saying here, in the sense of he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. This is an individual who is not seeing his sin the way God reveals sin is. He says, I don't need to confess this. I don't need no confession. And it means I don't need to change my mind about my lifestyle. I'm pretty good, Pastor. I'm pretty good. And, 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 and it, we see this all the time with, with people uh, in the sense of well, do you know you've sinned against God? Well, but everybody has. Well, yeah, but we're not talking about everybody. We're talking about you. We're wanting to try to help you here. Have you ever told a, a, a liar violated one of the commandments? It don't matter which one. Well, yeah, everybody has. Yeah, but what about you? Yeah, well, look, I'm a pretty good person. I'm a pretty good person. Y'all you know, don't bother nobody. I don't hurt nobody. I'm a pretty good person. And what they're basically trying to say is I don't need to confess. I don't need to change my plan of action. I'm pretty good. I don't need to be in church. I don't, I don't need to go down there. I appreciate you inviting me, but I'm going to pass. Well, the Bible says that type of individual, the Bible says, shall not prosper. But then he says confession. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Now, the word confession deals with agreeing with truth. And saying, I'm not lining up to it. I'm not lining up with it. I, let me say it like this. It means this. I have violated truth. It don't matter what truth. I have violated it. Truth can be violated. And when truth is violated, that needs to be acknowledged and it needs to be confessed. And he says, if you'll confess it, you're going to find mercy. You'll find mercy. And we know that mercy is an attribute of God that works toward our welfare in a good way. Repentance, really, I, I think repentance is, I'm, I just say this, I'm thankful for repentance. I'm thankful for repentance because I know the type of life that, that um, God leads and saves people from, 
in my personal life, and I'm very thankful for repentance. I'm glad, I'm very glad, although at the moment, you know, when I was sitting in the pew years ago and I got convicted of my sin, and I'll be serious, I thought I was in big trouble, man. I thought I was going to die. And I, by the way, and I'm not alone here either. I, this is a personal testimony of just Pastor Hart. This is the testimony of a lot of Christians. I thought I was a goner. And I tell you one thing, I didn't come forward that day. And Brother Matt, because I didn't come forward all that week, I was messed up. I was messed up. I mean, Brother James, I couldn't sleep right that week. I was having problems thinking. You know, the beer guy every 3.30 going and getting the beer while we're rolling up the tools and everybody from the crew getting together on a job site. I wasn't doing that. My mind, I was being talked about. There was a lot of things going through my mind. And I thought, I'll go to church the following week. And I went to church the following week. And that same thing started happening. That same, and I didn't really understand conviction, but that same sorrow started to come into me. And, and this sorrow started to really bur burn my heart. And I thought, man, alive, I got to get out of here. And instead of getting out of there, I went forward. And I went home. And I got all the liquor out of my home. No one told me to do that. And got things out of my house, change of action, started going to church, started hanging out with the right people. I didn't involve myself in the wrong people, hanging out with the right people, doing the right things, trying to. It's a change of action. Now, did I fully understand all of that? No, but it was working. It was, it was, it was, it was, the repentance was working. I mean, it, it, with faith, obviously, and I'm, I'm not going to leave that out, but we're talking particularly about repentance. Now, so I believe repentance does involve a turning. Now, it revolves this, a turning from something to something. Okay? Now, again, this is a work of the Holy Ghost, not me. It's not a work of, you need to do this. It's not that. You've got to be careful here. If you're doing that, you're going to die and go to hell. There could be truth in that. But the Holy Spirit has got to... We just got to be careful about the Holy Spirit doing this work here. So repentance involves a turning from something to something else. Let me give you some thoughts and some biblical application just on this definition thought. 1 Kings 8.48. 1 Kings 8.48. And, so and so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul. And this is Solomon talking about Israel. If they get away, returning unto God. And the land of their enemies, which led them away captive, and pray unto thee toward their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name, then hear thou their prayer and supplication, and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause. So here we find they are turning from their sin and they're turning to, to God. And so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies, which led them captive, and pray unto thee toward their land, Jerusalem, which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name. Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause. Ezekiel chapter 14. Here's another thought of a definition about turning. Repentance, uh, turning from to. Ezekiel 14, 6. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. So obviously, the simple message of Ezekiel is turn your faces from to. And by the way, again, the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Ghost, it's, it's, it's a work of Him uh, giving us this type of spiritual perception and ability. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 30. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Now watch. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Now, let me say something. Is God our ruin? 
God is not our ruin. Iniquity is our ruin. And he is telling them to turn from that iniquity and if they're going to survive and live and be restored, God's the only one that can do that. We, we know that. He's the only one that can do that. What did John the Baptist say? In Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. Us who profess Christ as our Lord and Savior should be living that kind of life. We should not be in violation of things of God. We should be living the right kind of life. And I'm talking about a life that Scripture reveals. And this is why it is so important that we stay close to the Word of God. And, and follow the Word of God. Now watch, watch this. We're talking about a turning. We're talking about a turning. We talked about a mind change. Now let's talk about the turning. Again, another thought. Acts 8.22, but Peter said unto him, Simon, thy money perish with thee. This man was looking to get what Peter was doing other than salvation. He was looking to get what Peter was doing in the sense of miracles and such. He was looking to get this to buy this. He was look, wanting to buy such. But Peter said unto him, unto him, Simon, thy money perisheth with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God, we would say salvation, may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. So Peter's telling us, man, you need to leave this, this mind style. You, you need to leave this style of thinking. You need to leave this ideology. You need, to, you need to leave this. You need to turn from this. And we know we turn to Acts chapter 26, verse 20. <clears throat> but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles. Watch that they should repent. And here it is. I mean, we know this, but they should repent and turn to who? God. And by the way, you know what he says? And do works meet for repentance. Do works meet for repentance. And it's not, once again, um, it's not that we're judging a man, um, we're going to judge a person by what they do. We can't know the intentions of a person's heart but by their fruits, you'll know them to an extent. And that's even something today that Christians, I believe, have adjusted to. They've adjusted to being Christ-like. And I believe that, that that can be a major downfall in Christianity. But that's just my fault or my, my thoughts. And it would be a, an individual's fault if that was a credit toward him. We wouldn't want that. We want to make sure that people are saved and they know Christ is their Lord and Savior. So here he says that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. And I would suppose every Christian, when they get saved by their faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, uh, well, here, let me back say it like this. Okay, well, I'm sorry for my sin, dear God. I violated the law. I, I've broken the law and I've sinned against thee. I'm sorry. What do I got to do to forgiveness? And God says, there's only one way you can be forgiven. You need a blood atonement. And the blood atonement, the propitiation for your forgiveness is found in my son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has the ability by his shed sinless blood to cleanse us and wash us from that blood and remove us from the, by the way, he does remove us from the guilt and the sorrow of that sin and restore us into fellowship with God. And, and so and by doing such, we are bought with a price. We're to glorify God with our body, our soul, our mind, our strength. We're bought with, with, with him and by him and we live for him. We look towards him. We don't live for ourselves. The Christian life is not about your ideas and your philosophies and our philosophies about working things out and trying to weigh things out on your personal scale of wisdom, whatever that may be. Whatever that may be. The Christian life is about following the Word of God. And when we're not following the Word of God, we should repent. We should repent. And if we're not repenting, something is deeply wrong. Something's deeply wrong. Because you're not seeing God the way you need to see Him. And you're deceived. 
You're fooled. When we see God the way we need to see him, we won't flirt with sin too long. We may mess up and slip every now and then, but we ain't going to live there in a fellowship with that. There ain't no way, no way. False professors can, but not a true born again child of God, not without chastisement, not without being corrected of the Lord. It can't happen. It's impossible. It's impossible. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 21, Paul, with his second letter to the church of Corinth, he says, and lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you and that I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. So here Paul is making mention that they need to turn from them unto the Lord. This would be the, 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 the particular thought. They have not done that. They've not turned from self unto the Lord. They've not done that. Repentance is a turning. All right. Um, to the pastor, 2 Timothy 2, 25, starting at verse 23. I am told, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strife, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patience, and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. You want to talk about a chast? That's a pastor's task. Instructing those that oppose themselves. Watch. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by his will. <clears throat> now, our time has gotten away from us. But let me just give you a, a little example of all this. And I think this is an example I've chosen because I think we're going to understand it pretty clearly. A couple more pieces of scripture. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 deals with repentance as a turning to. Revelations chapter 2 verse 5. Um, the, the church there, again, we quoted that, was turned to uh, repent and do the first works. But let me mention this little story. And I think we'll see what, we're, what we've tried to teach today. I think we'll see this. Now listen carefully. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. That's sinful activity. And when he had spent all... There arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And this is obviously in Luke chapter 15. Uh-oh, verse 17. And when he came to himself, he came to himself right here. He's sitting in a mess. He's in a mess. He came to himself. He said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to eat and to spare, and I perish with hunger? Action. I will arise. I will arise. I will arise and go to my father. Now he's talking now. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against thee. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Now all that sounds good. But here's the big question. Would he follow through? Because a lot of Christians make a repentance in their mind. And know what they should be doing. And know what they want to do and make a commitment. And never stick to it. Never stick to the commitment. They know what they should be doing. They know what they got to do in the sense of whatever it may be in their life. So we see his mind, his mind is working here. He came to himself. He is comparing his sinful life to the life that he once had. There's no comparison. 
he makes the conclusion in his mind, I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to tell him I've sinned. I've sinned against you and I've sinned against God. He mentions heaven. I've sinned against God or, or heaven, he says, but he's talking about God. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Did he do it? Yes, he did. There's your action. Change him. This action would have never happened in this prodigal as we know its life unless it didn't first start in his mind. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Watch. Repentance is more than an attitude. Repentance is an act. It's more than an attitude. It's an act. We may know what we ought to be doing, but that don't mean that we're, we're acting on it. And repentance, re- repentance, as we see in this story, there's just, I just want you to see the two things of the lesson today. We'll continue with this. Um, because I can tell you, just as the devil is, there is a bogus repentance. There is a bogus repentance. There's a false one, and it's mainly in the Baptist churches, mainly, but the charismatic movement's real big with it. But we want to be careful of that. We want to be careful about a, uh, of making a false profession under, under the guise of something easy that's going to prosper me or, or promote me or give me or make me. Now, I think salvation can do all of that, but obviously we don't get saved to be promoted. We're not getting saved to get what we can get. We get saved to be forgiven of our sin. And there are other things that come along with it. We praise the Lord for that. But what you see here with the prodigal, as we would call it, there was a change of mind. And then with that change of mind, there was a change of action. And you know what happened? Because he repented, he probably, watch, he probably saved his life. If he'd have stayed in this situation, he had probably perished. And by the way, that's how serious repentance is, ladies and gentlemen. That's how serious repentance is. It's so serious that for the Christian, we go tiptoeing away from the things that God has told us to turn from. God can say, that's enough. You're coming home with me. Or he'll do something and bring something into your life that's tragic to try to show you this is wrong. Now, that's his love, you see. Not only is that his love, according to Hebrews chapter 12, but that's also so that we, we, as I mentioned Wednesday night, so that we would be partakers of his holiness. Partakers of his holiness. And that's what God wants for us. So, repentance, let's stop with this. Repentance, and we're going to look at this, I think, I think four more weeks, because there's really a lot here. We got all kinds of examples of this throughout the whole Bible. All kinds of examples. Paul the Apostle, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of examples of what I've just explained to you this morning. And we're going to look at those. Um, repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of action. Now, obviously, for the Christian, we know faith is involved in this. We'll talk about that. But our time is, is up this morning. All right. And maybe next week, God willing we will just study the repentance of Nineveh. Next time you study that little book, look at the subject of repentance. Throughout the whole book. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you.